Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Jago with Bill McGurn and Kim Strassel here. We're talking about Kim Reynolds' pending endorsement of Ron DeSantis in Iowa. And Bill, you basically suggested that we need a big explosion somehow, some big external event to take Trump out. That may be true. He's still leading enormously in all the states, though less so in Iowa. And, and I wonder if, in fact, if somebody emerged in Iowa, it didn't necessarily win but uh, eroded Trump's lead there to 40 or less than 40, whether it be uh, Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or less likely at this stage, Tim Scott. I'm not so sure that that wouldn't send a warning shot to other Republicans, particularly going into New Hampshire, that, hey, pay attention. Republicans aren't necessarily sold on Trump. I think that's true, but I think the advantage is still Trump's. Probably if that happened, the Democrats would help his campaign by indicting him again, some (laughs) flimsy charge, and we (laughs) I'll be pulling out her hair. I think there's so many question marks like potential landmines, both the Democratic and Republican nominations. I don't think we can be certain of either. But Trump has a pretty formidable lead and it only grows, you know, when Democrats go after him. But again, I sort of think it has to be outside the process that something takes them out. I should confess, you know, last year I thought neither of the two men would get the nomination. I still think that, but I admit it's less likely now. Yeah, the main vulnerability right now for Trump is that it's the criminal trials, but those don't start one in March and one in May. Two of the three, the other one isn't uh, set up the Georgia case yet. The trial date isn't set. If he's convicted in those, I think it would hurt him, but that might not be the case if he is convicted until after the nomination is mostly settled. Most of the primaries are over. Kim, do you think that the Rebels endorsement means much in Iowa? Will it help DeSantis restore his clear number two position? I do. I think it'll both help DeSantis, but I think it also, as you note, is another signal to voters in Iowa, who, by the way, do take their voting very seriously, their caucus going very seriously, to take another look at other candidates. Don't forget, I mean, Kim Reynolds is very much admired in that state. There have already been a lot of Republicans who weren't very thrilled with Donald Trump's treatment of her. Definitely, you know, just sort of not attending events that she was putting on, beating on her. He put out some pretty mean statements again on all of this. So I think that there's certainly an opportunity for people to take a look at this and decide whether or not this is really the right position for them. And I'm not convinced if you look at those polls and you dig into some of them, especially the New York Times polls, there's still a majority of Iowans who say that they want Donald Trump as their first choice, but they say that they're still looking at other candidates. That to me is the key number. And I think that that is what Kim Reynolds knows and is trying to play on. Yeah. All right. Let's turn here to the Hamas Israel divisions within the Democratic Party, which are breaking out in uh, some of the more vitriolic terms than I usually see, usually see in uh, intra-party politics. The squad, uh, remember Rashida Tlaib and uh, Cori Bush and others, are basically, I think it's fair to say, taking the side of Hamas. This is not sitting well with uh, many other uh, mainstream Democrats. Tlaib said pointedly in a video that she released that uh, she is holding Joe Biden responsible for what she called genocide against Palestinians, the Israeli bombing in Gaza and attempts to uh, destroy Hamas, which is the Israeli asserted war goal. And that's quite the charge against a president of her own party. And in response, some Democrats are now saying we're going to get primary challengers to Taleb and others. And let's listen to a ad that a uh, pro-Israel group has put out against Congressman Taleb. She's one of only seven Democrats in Congress to vote against missile protection for Israel. One of only nine Democrats against condemning the brutal attack on Israel by Hamas. Her legislation will allow the terrorists to rearm themselves. And she refuses to answer even this horrific question. You can't comment about Hamas terrorists chopping off baby heads? Tell Rashida Tlaib she's on the wrong side of history and humanity. Well, Bill, that's some ad. (laughs) Yes, I I consider it, you know, they're talking about the Hamas caucus of the Democratic Party. 
And I'm writing about that this week. To me, is so much trouble for Joe Biden. You know, we mentioned those numbers in the polls on the states and how he's behind with young people. The same split is evident on Israel. Like a, a minority, 49 percent approved of, when they were asked, do you approve of Israel's actions? Only 49 percent Democrats approved. And that's a division that is reflected in the youth. They disapprove by a wider margin. And I think it augurs for a very, very bad convention. You know, if Joe Biden insists on staying in the race, he picked Chicago because he thought it would a union town would highlight his achievements for American workers. But I think there are uncomfortable parallels to the 68 convention in Chicago that was a PR disaster. Humphrey won both the nomination, which wasn't easy because he hadn't won primary, and the Vietnam platform fight. But he went on to lose, and there were fights in the streets between anti-war protesters and the police. And we see that with these demonstrations, what they're saying. I can't believe they won't all flock to um, Chicago and cause trouble. Kim, these Democrats are in, uh, like Tlaib, uh, and Ilhan Omar in Minnesota, Ocasio-Cortez in New York City, Cori Bush in Missouri. And others, they're probably what Jamal Bowman, I think, is another one. There are seven or eight at least, but they're all in safe Democratic districts. So if you're going to beat them, you have to beat them in a primary. And that's why these announced challenges are so interesting. I think there's already a Democrat in Missouri running against Cori Bush. So that's fascinating and I think will play out here in the next few months in the and have real implications for not just President Biden's reelection, as Bill says, but also for what the next Congress is like and what the votes are going to be in this Congress. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what the Democrats don't want to see happen right now. And we've had so much a focus on, you know, some of the more extreme members on the right. You know, remember Madison Cawthorn, of course, you know, that person was primaried, lost. And now we're seeing it happen a little bit on the left. There's a strong sentiment in in this country, obviously, for support for Israel. And Joe Biden has stuck with that. What concerns me about this, Paul, just as the wider policy issue here, is we're talking about the politics and the internecine warfare within Democrats. But that doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I still continue to worry that these protests, like what we saw in, here in Washington, D.C. this week, and the backlash, the polls out of Michigan showing a drop in support for the president, possibly related to his stance on Israel among some quarters of the Democratic electorate, that that's going to make the White House turn course on policy. And that would be the real dangerous thing here. So while it's good to see the party standing up with these ads, etc., to stand up for some of its long time convictions. I'm still very concerned about the power these progressives have and the megaphone and how willing the White House has been so often in the past to listen to that faction of the party. All right, Kim, you get the last word. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Kim. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day on Potomac Watch, and we'll be here Tuesday and Wednesday this week to talk about the uh, elections in the Virginia, Kentucky, and elsewhere on Tuesday. Thank you for listening.